Like Ian's I don't know if I'm, di- don't know if I'm disagreeing with Ray. I'm just sort of. Well, look, you know. I, yes, I, I, I've decided you are. Um, and one thing no, I'll not. say. <laughs> they shouldn't mark it. Uh, is that me up? That's away. not even. That's not even three seconds. <laughs> it's vibrating and making noise. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. Just a reminder that if you're streaming us on SoundCloud or iTunes, you can also look at our beautiful faces on the site, on video, and vice versa. If you've had the distinct pleasure of watching us, you can then also download the audio via SoundCloud or iTunes. And talking about beautiful faces, I have the pleasure of being (laughs) the filling. Who's joining us? (laughs) (laughs) I have the pleasure once more of being the filling in a light reading sandwich. Where the pieces of bread, respectively, are Ray and Ian. Uh, well, that makes me, I don't want to speculate. But um, thanks, guys. Thanks for joining me. So this week, we're going to be talking about broadband lies and how UK ISPs need to start telling the truth a little bit more. We've been talking about India turmoil uh, and how most of the market's been completely turned on its head by Reliance Geo. Uh, we're going to be talking about... Uh, Auto reflection, automation in the telecoms industry, and why you should care. And we might even, if we're lucky, start getting onto Ray's favourite cocktail of the moment. But let's see if we've got time. Uh, I'm so, definitely talking about that. Yes, <laughs> indeed. So, uh, so I'll kick off this time. Um, I've been writing about Ofcom, which is slightly more interesting. Than it might sound on first impression. Uh, because they are hassling UK internet service providers, ISPs, for being misleading in their sort of broadband speed claims at the point of sale. So we've all been there. You might go to a you might go to a um, uh, comparison site, or just go straight to their site, and they'll be offering 100 megabits per second or something like that. And you think that'll do nicely because I'm only getting about four at the moment. Um, but then in practice, when you actually sign up for this thing and you only commit yourself to about a year or so, what you actually get uh, on average is far less than that claim. And of course, they their defence is they say up to. I was going to say, do you think they're up to something? Yes, <laughs> up to something. That, that should have been my little uh, my little bit at the beginning. Maybe maybe we'll change it, Pierre, in the <laughs> caption to up to something. Um, Ofcom's up to something. There we go. And uh, you know, and I've got to say, you know, I'm not always in favour of regulators and and sort of public sector poking its nose into everyone's business, but as a consumer, um, I, no one else gets away with being able to say that. You know, I go and buy something, they get, and, and let's say it's up to 50, and I normally get about 10. Um, you haven't been to TK Maxx lately, have you? Oh, really? Tell us Prices more. Prices up to 70% off, right? And but mostly practice. 5% off. Yes, well, there is that. Uh, but that's, that's still that's a general sort of sale claim yeah. rather than the specific product. Indeed. If they said that, that shirt will get you up to... Noticed. <laughs> <laughs> up to 10 people telling you how great you look. And no one, which I believe is more is close to the truth, <laughs> has said it. A then, big uh, fat zero. then I think you're entitled to complain. Anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, so they're just saying that this up to business is bollocks, basically, and and I agree with them. And and what they're coming out with is more sensible stuff. They're saying what you should actually be able to have to say is a realistic minimum over a given time let's say you you know you're on the internet in the evening or whatever <laughs> most people are you, or you mean a realistic average no i think it's a minimum i think that that's what they're saying that you should they should have a guaranteed minimum you will definitely get at least this um but yeah a realistic average would also still be more helpful than one of these Is that up it's to buffering things. buffering yeah um and you know and you got these brands like i went and looked um just as a quick bit of ad hoc research when i was writing it and looked on the bt site and of course their brands are infinity so it's it's absolutely endemic, it's intrinsic in all the branding and the marketing of all their stuff that they've got this astronomical, or or, or in, that, in the case of Infinity, uncapped numbers. Um, and yeah, and that's what they come out with. And, and various, you know, as is often the way for us, various um, sort of pundits have come in and said whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. But, you know, I'll put it to the floor. Ray, I'll start with you as, as both a telecoms expert and as a consumer. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly a consumer. Uh, what do you make of all that? Well, I mean, yes, Ofcom should be pointing these things out, but people need to wise up. And I think at the end of the day, there are statistics out there as well uh, from Ofcom, I think that are widely reported in the press as well on a regular basis that show exactly what kind of average speeds people are getting. And, and it's the same with mobile as well. And the companies that 
basically are shown to be the biggest bullshitters are called out right. in public on quite a regular basis. So I think there is a certain amount of public accountability uh, already, um, but maybe just asking them to not print the words up to in two point uh, <laughs> font size. You know, if you're saying 28, if you're saying 100 megabits, and you're saying that in 48 point uh, black type, then the up to needs to be in the same, yep. you know, there you go. I should work at Ofcom, shouldn't I? Problem <laughs> solved. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a fair point. What about you, Ian? What do you reckon? Uh, I think it's a little bit sad, really, isn't it? The kind of megabits per second marketing that goes right. on anyway, because I'm not sure that anybody really gives a damn as long as, they, as, long as well, their broadband connection works. Then, <sighs> right. I mean, I mean how many people, people need do. 100 megabits per second? People don't need it. They, they, they just want to, you know, my mum and dad read the news on, on the internet and they check a few emails. And, but that's and, what people buy it for. You stick yeah. a higher speed on a broadband um, service and more people will buy it. Yeah, of course, the marketing of it, because they've all got it stuck into yeah. the marketing. So it does people, actually make a difference. It, yeah, people think they're getting something better when yeah, they buy something yeah. that has 70 megabits don't attached to it instead yeah. of one. But, don't, don't let him pull rank. But they don't, don't need that. So so in, in terms of the perception that they're... I mean, if they are getting a lot, lot less than these marketing claims, which which seems to be the case, does it really matter anyway? Uh, you know, I mean, there are times when your connection goes down or you've got buffering in the evening and you can't watch Netflix, Game of Thrones or whatever, but... Um, generally speaking, it's it's not as though we're all kind of. I think we're needing. setting ourselves up for a little sort of thirty second debate here. I'm gonna I'm gonna I think, I'm gonna, it, I I'm think gonna, it sounds like Ian's got a reliable. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm disagreeing well. with Ray. I'm just sort of. Well, yeah. I, yes, I, you are. I've decided you are. Um, and one thing <laughs> no, I'll <it's> say. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I'll say, um, in my opinion. Sorry, Pierre, you just chucked your phone at me. Oh, timer! You want me to do the thirty second timer thing? Oh, we haven't got the little bell anymore. I, I think we can we can live without that. Um, one thing I'm going to say before I put it to Ray to state his case in 30 seconds is I think uh, metrics increasingly in these times of sort of price comparison sites and all that sort of thing, I think the world's become more metric thanks to IT, internet, that sort of thing. And people look at metrics in the absence of, you know, they probably should think about it more and they should research it more. But if they're just looking at like a, a spreadsheet, a table of things, and they think that higher number equals better, that's often going to be um, a, uh, a catalyst for their money. Anyway, so I think, let's do, let's do a little 30-second debate. Ray, why do you think that um, the metrics are an important thing in buying a bit of broadband? Um, faster broadband means you can do more on it, but it should be sold um, in a very um, straightforward and upfront way not up to in 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 10 point and 100 megabit and 100 point yep. it should be made very clear so that people can see the entire proposition all at the same time cool. no hidden no no small print cool. kill the small print kill the small print in summary well inside 30 seconds well done so ian you are now going to tell us why it doesn't matter i don't know how to get your thing to reset by the way <laughs> why it doesn't matter yeah well i'm not sure it doesn't matter i just think that maybe they shouldn't mark it uh is that me up? Oh, that's away. not even. That's <laughs> even three seconds. It's vibrating and making noises. <laughs> well, that's my point. Uh, say, it, say it again, mate. I was distracted. I, I think. I think maybe if they tried marketing on a different basis and did something totally radical, I mean, yeah. they were always told, told that telcos need to get away from this obsession with speeds and right. network capabilities. Yeah, nobody why told not, the marketing department that. Yeah. No one told the marketing. But why not? Why not sort of market reliability or try and try and do something completely different, um, as Monty Python would say? And maybe I don't know. Maybe it would pay off. Okay. I think that's a good point. I mean, the, the that was, I presume, within 30 seconds. Uh, our our high-tech timing device has now gone back to Pierre, <laughs> producer Pierre. I mm. mean, one thing I'd say about that, me and just to follow up on it, I think it's a, I think it's a nice sentiment, but I'm probably with Ray in so much as I wonder how effective it would be. Mm. So yes, you're right. We're always nagging them to to not commoditize themselves and sell on on sort of value, added value, but. Perhaps the perhaps that horse has bolted and broadband is commoditized. But if you said we guarantee you a broadband service that will meet all your needs and never go down, and we're going to throw in a fluffy toy as well or something, <laughs> yeah. maybe that's the way to get customers. That's what the insurance companies do, isn't it? They sell little wagging dogs. Do you know, I don't get that. And the price and comparison sites. It's like, you know, you can buy like a house or a car, and they're trying to incentivize you to go through their site because you might get some two quid cuddly toy it's just bizarre but they're presumably doing it, yeah, it the, works. Uh, compare the meerkat guys yeah, yeah. so i mean what, we're coming to the conclusion here that 
consumers are a bit stupid, I think, um, which is a dangerous thing to do. I think only you've come to that conclusion. <laughs> I think consumers are being duped. Right. But they've got to allow themselves to be duped, haven't they? No. <laughs> oh, you little populist, you. Um <laughs> And uh, okay, so so that's interesting. Um, I'm still I'm still pleased that they're doing it. It'd be interesting to see how the industry responds. One thing I think also about regulation, you know, telecoms, unlike a lot of industries, is more heavily regulated, and rightly so because the barriers to entry are so high. It's not like any you know, a, a total open market where anyone can decide to become a, a telco. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, you don't necessarily agree. Um, and uh, and so, because you've got an effective oligopoly in, in nearly all markets, there has to be a bit of regulation. Otherwise, they'll probably conspire to take the piss out of the market. So, if they set, if they raise the um, standards of accountability and transparency, and you know, as Ray was saying, just um, clearness, clarity when on your marketing and sales collateral for absolutely everyone. I don't see how any individual companies are at a disadvantage, and the consumer should be at an advantage. So that's what I reckon about that. One uh, other little off commy tangent. I was writing about them earlier on this week. Um, originally, Jamie, who's just on his way back from Helsinki at the moment, by the way. He's, he's, he's a real jet setter, isn't he? I can't think of anything mildly slanderous to say about his visit to Helsinki like I did when we went to Amsterdam. <laughs> but let's all put our heads together. Uh, but, you know, he's still sort of brushing off the sauna or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's the best I could come up with for Helsinki, I'm afraid. Saying nothing. Yeah, OK, fair enough. Just let just let Scott sort of dig the hole even deeper for himself. Yeah. We'll um, let you finish. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. He covered um, Sharon White, who is the head of Ofcom, wrote a piece in the Financial Times saying how out of order um, three, and we've covered this before, how out of order three in the EE, are for challenging uh, 5G auction rules. The main reason being that they will um, probably delay the whole process. Uh, and I spoke to various people um, after that and got an idea for an opinion piece where I just sort of went with the idea that maybe they're actually secretly quite happy that especially EE intervened, because it was three that kicked it off. Three's not happy because they, just to recap, they wanted this threshold of 30% of all the available spectrum to be owned by one of the four major um, mobile players. And currently, um, E slash BT has got about 43%, I think. So they obviously wanted a lot of spectrum to be taken off them and presumably given to three. Um, and then E just thought, well, we've got to get involved here because this is now going to court. And if the only thing the judge is hearing is, is three's perspective, then there's a good chance of us uh, not getting a favorable result. So they come back with what was primarily a defensive move and Sharon White criticised that. But I actually think they probably did her a favour because now when it goes to court and now when she's going, you know, you know Ofcom's job is supposed to be to speak to all stakeholders and come up with the, the best possible sort of middle ground. Um, she can say, well, here we go. It's two opposite sort of sides of the argument and we're somewhere in the middle. So I think we've done a good job and everyone can just shut up. I think Sarah and I don't know if you guys got any view on that. No. No? Ian? Um, I... I think your analysis is right. I mean, the only Good thing I, the only thing I think about the whole you know, this fight the idea that the spectrum sort of dispute at the moment will set the UK back immeasurably. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd totally go along with that um, no. because I think a lot of the early stuff that you'll see on 5G anyway for the next few years is is going to be um, you know speaking to analysts, it's going to be this kind of mobile broadband but better than yeah. than what we've got and and the kind of um, services that are sort of really make a difference economically perhaps are the ones that are going to get used in industries to do things like connected cars and yep. uh, whatever it might be those are a little bit further out anyway so unless this dispute really drags on a long time then I'm not sure how and how you can get um, special have. testing licenses for those bits of spectrum yeah, um, exactly. Those sort of higher yeah. frequency bits of spectrum that, that are yeah. going to play a major role in 5G. Yeah. So it's not like you and can't. There's, and there's a lot of spectrum you can use with 5G. That's the other thing. Yeah. You can talk to sort of spectrum experts. They say there's quite a bit that, you know, they can refarm some of their existing holdings potentially. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's only relating to a couple of bands because I, I think one of the things BT wants is a kind of super auction, doesn't it, where all the spectrum gets That's right. offered at one time. So a whole big chunk from 3.4 gigahertz band all the way out to 3.8, yeah. whereas right now we're doing it piecemeal. Piecemeal, exactly. Yeah. So, the, so the dispute only, only sort of, I guess if this issue gets re resolved somehow, then we should be able to proceed with the other stuff more quickly. But um, Yeah, I think they're thinking, you know, while, while we're getting involved, we might as well put out a wish list of other stuff we'd like. Yeah. 
Okay, cool. Well, we're going to. So it's like a mega shark, but for for Spectrum. Mega shark. Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> Just. It's a shark mega. got to do with anything. <laughs> I was drifting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. It's, it's a shark, mate. Okay. Um, uh, on that note, I think we'll turn to Ian. <laughs> um, uh, Ian. Yeah. India turmoil or, or reliance wars. What's going on in India at the moment? Um, well, it's, it's a continuation, I guess, of the uh, upheaval that's already been going on since kind of late last year when uh, a new player came into the market called Reliance Geo, mm-hmm. um, which is. Uh, part of Reliance Industries, so very big, well, well-known well um, yeah. conglomerate in India, owned by one of the country's richest men, and they've sort of come in and offered um, free services, essentially. Yeah. I think free, completely free voice for a certain p- period yeah. of time, or maybe maybe that's actually kind of forever, and yeah, then free and data free for a well, Exactly, yeah. free data for a few months. And and it's just it's just caused, like you say, it's caused turmoil throughout yeah. the industry. The bigger players have, have kind of been reporting huge earnings setbacks has been a wave of consolidation moves uh one thing that that a couple of things happened this week Uh, one is that a a planned merger between uh, reliance communications which is owned by not to be confused with uh, reliance geo it's it's actually owned by one of the so reliance geo is owned by mukesh ambani uh, Reliance um, Communications, owned by his brother Am- right. Anil Ambani, um, just hate and each other they, yeah, they, they've sort of been at each other's yeah. um, uh, each other's throats, big, I guess, in the like past. A big episode of Dynasty. Yeah, so Reliance uh, Communications is one of those big established players. I think yeah. it's the fifth biggest company. Right. Been trying to merge with Aircel, which is another big player, and they've they've had to call it off this week. It's not entirely clear why, but they've cited regulatory obstacles, yeah, pushback from creditors. Name, you know bit of a general moan at various other people for not mm. being able to kind of um, pull off the wedding. Yeah, um, and, they, and they even spoke about sort of vested interests. And yeah, and, and and as a result, Reliance Communications is now been, sort of been forced into a bit of an asset sale, it seems. Yeah. It's trying to sell towers and various other things that it has because it, it, it's got a, a huge debts that it needs yeah. to pay off. And that's that's a problem that a lot of the other uh, big players have, actually. There's a, there's a sort of mountain of debt in the industry, Indian industry um, and the... Um, and they can't sort of service it through the earnings they're getting at the moment, which no. are going down all the time because of this pressure that's been caused by Reliance Geo. Yeah. So another player called uh, Tata Teleservices, which is owned by Tata Group, the very another very big sort yeah, of Indian like conglomerate, yeah, in India, is, yeah. Is, is is sort of on the verge of, of sort of throwing in the towel completely. It seems it was, it was trying this. to trying to merge its business, but yeah. can't find partners, and seems it might kind of have to sort of give up mm. the game entirely. So it's it's, I mean, where it all ends, I don't know, but Re- Reliance Geo isn't probably making money out of no. you know what it's doing at the moment it's kind of subsidizing it through all these other things that uh, exactly. Mukesh Ambani does in petrochemicals or whatever it might be um, and they're, they're aiming for I think they've got ambitions in the short term to have what is it 11% of the market or something like that and they, but, they, they but have, ultimately I think going they for broke of, all sorts of records for subscriber growth and yeah I mean they're, they're up to about a, over 100 million subscribers yeah. I think in just a few months you know which I mean? is I think unprecedented and and there's reports today I think uh, in some magazines they could be sort of going for potentially half of the market I think yeah. over the next few years it, and Barney's talking about which is uh, and it's, it's where where it all ends up. I don't know. But I know. Well, um, I wanted to ask Ray about that. I mean, my my impression is that um, for whatever reasons, so obviously this um, Reliance Geo and and the and the chap who owns it got pretty deep pockets, but it seems to have been allowed to come in and um, offer a bunch of stuff for free. Uh, it seems to be given some special dispensation in terms of nationwide 4G licenses. It, it just seems to be a lot of things that have gone in its favour. I'm just wondering what you think of it. The effect of I'm an entry sure like this on the market. Dimp- I don't think it got special dispensation. It got the 4G license at the same time as everybody else. Okay, but my it, understanding is it had the only nationwide one. Yeah, but it got this. It got it at the same time. They didn't actually get it in the auction. A, okay. Another company bought it, and then they bought that right, company. Okay. Uh, but they did end up with the only nationwide coverage of 4G. But they weren't a 3G operator before. This is a greenfield yeah. operator, so they've been. Uh, starting from scratch that's given them some advantages uh, as well as their deep pockets but I think ultimately uh, what this the introduction of RGO has done is it's just accelerated the consolidation in India that was needed anyway 
five years ago, I think there were 12 mobile operators in India. Yes, it's a very large market, but that's that was always too many. Consolidation was always needed. And I think, you know, there's always um, all ulterior motives around money and politics. But at the end of the day, I think that this has probably been regarded as a way to clear the decks perhaps right. a little bit quicker than would otherwise have happened yeah no I, th- I think that's a good point I suppose the only thing does I'll that say, sound convincing it did <laughs> <laughs> it did and you didn't mention sharks once <laughs> uh, I thought I'll oh, leave it at that then <laughs> you sure there's no other sort of marine metaphors you can shoehorn in there um, I, no I think I think that's a good point I suppose my only my only concern with something like that is Geo seems to be getting so much momentum that it may end up with an unhealthy piece of the action in terms of... Well, they're quite a long way from that at the moment. Yeah. Um, Two of the players that are merging are Vodafone and Idea, which I think are the second and third biggest at the moment. So they will become the new market leader. um, Barty Airtel's the biggest. I think Geo still then then would maybe right. be third. I don't third or fourth potentially. Okay, and we got those other ones. Uh, and, and, I mean, it's going to all... probably end up. It could potentially end up as the biggest if things carry on going right. the, way it's, the way it's going. But you don't think it's likely it's, it's going to get like fifty percent plus? Or anything well, that's like that. that's the, well at some point they the have to start charging. They have to start making yeah. money. Yeah, and the tendency to churn in India is very high. So there will come a point where people will start to churn back to the others right. from Geo unless they can deliver something like enhanced customer service which omg is like the kind of thing that might actually help people make money all over the world yeah. so yeah. it'll even itself out anyway. but the, the other thing about them is race said they're greenfield so they have quite a an, uh, sort of uh, advanced network as i understand it and yeah. they're, they're a bit bit further ahead it seems in legacy stuff to they don't have all that legacy stuff out. and they've they've they've, they've been quite sort of um, clever in terms of some of the marketing activities and promotions they've done f- so far yeah. In terms of trying to get low-cost 4G devices out, but also and kind is, of media push as this well. This is where the dull but boring stuff like having a, for example, something like a cloud billing system from scratch yeah. and a cloud CRM system, which other operators don't have, is going to actually probably play to their advantage as long as it all works correctly and they have all their ducks in a row. But, you yeah. know, they don't have to be fannying about with age-old systems that were totally. set up for 2G. Um, and not for a 4G data-heavy uh, digital services world. Yeah. That is no, uh, that is very relevant. I mean, there are, there are certain companies which I won't mention, but not a million miles away, where the uh, expenses system uh, <laughs> is is quite difficult to navigate through, thanks to sort of legacy. And uh, I think uh, we've all got some personal experience of what, how much of a drag on moving forward integrating legacy systems can be and I'm sure I know I don't always talk about either but I suspect Scott might not be here next week for the podcast <laughs> anyway so I'd just like to say it's been great uh, covering the telecoms industry <laughs> nice working all these with years, you. and uh, I look forward to seeing what the job centre but Ian has and I think everything's wonderful so yes very smooth um, <laughs> perhaps I should move on um, so yes no that, that's also a very good point so yeah it, hopefully it will even out and as you say there's still some very s- strong players and they're all owned by oligarchs with incredibly deep pockets as well so it does seem to be just a a, a, a sort of bloodletting of profits not not quite it'll be interesting to see just to come back to India for a second yeah. there, there's still two operators that are actually still state owned this might actually be the catalyst for the long awaited merger of those two operators BSNL and MTNL yeah. right and then and then we'll see you know that that, that might then lead to sub part privatization or whatever and that you know a lot of things could change that market very quickly mm. and it's for such a big market it's quite dynamic because unlike for example in China where pretty much everyone has a smartphone they they went from about like 30% smartphone ownership to about 80% in two or three years. It's incredible ramping of, of smartphone ownership. India's a bit further back in terms of that. A lot of people are still reliant on sort of basic phones, feature phones, and yeah. sort of 2G, 3G, that sort of thing. So they're actually going through this process of getting into the 4G and data-driven and smartphone-driven world. So that's probably been one of the things that's made it as volatile as it is because there's all these people upgrading. Um, so yeah, it's just a really you know we we both our sites we cover it a fair bit and it's a it's a really interesting market and the regulator just flaps with the wind you know yes 
changes yeah. their mind every two minutes. So. Although, as you say, maybe they've been quite canny here on on sort of you know. If it works out, they'll claim they've been canny. Yeah, they will, of course. But yes, well, that's a, that's a, we'll play that game. <laughs> so, uh, so Ray, you were just talking about the sort of nuts and bolts and how important they are. Nuts and um, bolts. I know you've been uh, thinking, straight writing, straight going to events about uh, automation recently. Um, why don't you give us a bit of a lowdown? Well, I think related to, so I mean, you know, uh, a lot of the conversation here today has been about stuff that's happened this week. I'm going to talk about stuff that's probably going to happen next month or next year. Uh, but I think that we're going to be hearing a lot more um, about automation in general, uh, network automation, process automation, uh, and the and the impact that that will have on uh, the the cultures and operations at communication service providers. Um, so yeah, last week I was at an edge computing, as was Ian, edge computing event, um, and I there's a real head of steam there for sure. Um, something that's been talked about for a while, but now seeing quite a lot of a lot of activity and decisions being taken, um, and I think we'll you know we'll come around to Mobile World Congress, for example, and I'd be gobsmacked if we don't hear the terms edge computing um, and automation alongside 5G yeah. uh, at Mobile that's World Congress and throughout 2018. Buzzwords. Yeah, and the whole automation thing is is something that is enabled by a lot of different parts of the puzzle. So that includes, um, you know, uh, the uh, next generation OSS and orchestration um, software, the introduction of machine learning yep. and other AI tools, analytics, um, analytics systems that are applied um, to to what really. Uh, matters to individual businesses within in the communication space. All of this stuff needs to come together. You need obviously the physical infrastructure, which includes edge computing, to make all of this automation happen. And but I think we're now getting to the point where various things are are coming together, and um, and we'll start to see some defined strategies uh, in 2018. Um, and you know that's something that we're starting to track and hear about and write about right now. And uh, just to, just to recap, edge computing is um, just taking the, the the sort of cloud closer to the edge of the mobile network. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean that's what. Yes, I mean that's that's one way of looking at the introduction of edge computing can be in a in a defined um, area, for example, within a, a factory for the industrial industrial IoT applications. But it can also be part of what's being uh, termed as fog which is a distributed cloud uh-huh. um, so it can be part of a, a a broader distributed cloud architecture or it can be application or network specific but the introduction of IT capabilities significant IT capabilities um, which would include virtual network functions at the edge of the network um, local processing storage and analytics is something that is going to enable some of these, I, I, go, I, spec, I, I guess what people might refer to as 5G applications yeah. in the future. But you can't wait until 5G is there and yeah. then start planning on edge computing. It doesn't no. work that way. So right now, I would say, you know, optical transport all the way to the edge, edge computing, analytics, and the introduction of machine learning are the kind of things that the, the CTOs are really like are turning their brains to mush. Yeah. Not not Me too. N- not new radio yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or 5G, the 5G right. specs. So, uh, so you there as well, were you, Ian? What, what did you take away from the whole? Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, as, as as Ray says, that event was 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 much bigger, notably this year than right. than last year, and this is a sign of the interest that companies have in it, and and you also see the internet players being quite active in this area. Uh, Amazon Amazon Web Services um, is is sort of regarded as as one of the companies that's that's kind of really taken an early lead, I guess, with this green grass initiative that they have. They're already kind of, you know, supporting commercial services right. at the moment um, by by doing exactly what Ray's talked about and getting the sort of intelligence much closer to to devices, basically, and to end users. Um, so the key thing is is you know one of the key benefits is just reducing that latency that you get in yeah. network connections. And like Ray says, everybody talks about five G, um, but 
no matter what you do on the sort of radio side, you're not going to get those latency benefits. You're not going to cut that that time down unless yeah. you actually re-architect this uh, the network. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about uh, that um, a few weeks ago, weren't we? The speed of light and all that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so they they sort of need to they need to get this uh, they need to get this re-architecting done to to support things like connected cars but not just I mean connected cars is the example that always gets used yeah. but it's there's a lot of um, Do you think connected factory cars automation is, is this, I think this decade's connected fridge <laughs> potentially I mean I think maybe on the industrial side it's um... I might walk out I might walk out <laughs> well I'm sorry mate I'm sorry I'll take that back <laughs> but I think the the stuff that's going on on the factory side maybe is more you know yes. more interesting th- um, that's more near term the industri- industrial IoT or industry 4.0 whatever you want to call it that's some of the near term applications and probably shorter term case studies that we're likely to see around this and I guess the industry will learn. I guess why Deutsche Telekom is suddenly talking about edge computing quite a bit more and seems to be launching initiatives that aren't necessarily tying in with with what some of the industry bodies are doing I mean Germany is desperate to have a sort of I mean it's it, the, the whole expression what is it, industry 4.0 well comes yeah from and they've the German been market. working on it for years yeah. whereas other markets or other countries have had no initiative yeah. so and, germany and is ahead of the game they actually have a manufacturing sector still yeah. um, so and the u.s yeah. and and the u.s as out. well you know companies like ge in the u.s have been all over this for years yeah. so. the U- u.s germany and china are the three right i think where you'd see edge computing being used to support that sort of industrial industry 4.0 initiative and, uh, and a sort of broader mega trend uh, ian you and i um were uh, chatting to nokia Earlier on this week, in fact, we were the only two journalists who did turn up for the chat with Nokia. You were, and um, <laughs> and uh, and they were talking about their sort of global services and how basically the the intersection of telecoms. <laughs> wasn't that funny? <laughs> That's just Ray making me laugh. Um, <laughs> the intersection Badge of, of honor. Yes, exactly. The cast. <laughs> remember, remember us, Nokia. Um, <laughs> did you say Nokia? Yeah, yeah, they love this show, don't they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I thought I said something wrong there when you asked <laughs> me. Um, don't say Nokia again. Okay, I won't. I won't say Nokia again. Um, yeah, the, the intersection of old school sort of telecoms uh, vendors like them, yeah. like the N company, um, and uh, and then IT sort of more system integrator that the sort of pure play IT services companies could be someone like IBM or you could be even getting into like SIs like Accenture or whatever um, and those two worlds seem to be colliding more as a direct consequence of these um, sort of technological trends you two were just describing and you were hearing about yeah. and uh, you know it makes me wonder I know it's not as simple as that. I think they can coexist they're all sort of talking nice um, but there are going to be areas where they're directly competing one coming at it from a sort of network DNA standpoint, another coming at it from a sort of data center or sort of IT standpoint. And I guess, you know, I'm not saying that there's going to be a winner from one direction or the other, but um, there are going to be times where they're increasingly clashing. Well, I've been wanting to say this for a year, but for telecom operators, they shouldn't let fog be a missed opportunity. Oh, (laughs) yes. Now it's my turn to threaten to leave. (laughs) No, yes. I, when it comes to edge computing, I think some of what you're talking about is you can see that in the industry bodies that have, have sort of taken shape. Um, the telecom one really is Etsy, I guess, um, which is pushing this uh, pushing this initiative, co- which was originally called Mobile Edge Computing, although it's it's changed the name to, to Multi Access Edge Computing in the in the last year. Um, Just to make it even more then, catchy. To make it even more catchy, yeah. and then and then and then from the the IT world, the sort of Intel's and Microsofts, you've got um, you know what Ray just alluded to, which is a group called Open Fog, um, and they both have quite different visions, really, of what um, di- the distributed cloud is about. I guess okay. um, they, I mean, one one of the things that you did notice a lot at the conference was the two of them sort of saying they're playing nice, and um, you know they they announced an agreement, I think, to collaborate, yeah. but. But um, there's certainly some, you do sense some kind of clash, potential clash, yeah. um, some frustration on the part of operators. I mean, it's, it's like all these things, you know, once you get a multitude of bodies popping up and those yeah. aren't the only two, it's the sort of uh, room for confusion, I guess. Yeah, um, and there's a lot of it. So not only have we got like the, the sort of networking vendors from one side and the, and the IT specialists from the other, but then we got these relatively new entrants like Amazon who, you know, let's not forget originally was a retailer or e-tailer, 
Um, and they're kicking everyone's ass with all this on the data center side. And then, as you say, we've got the operators. We've got people like in the, in the US especially, um, AT&T and Verizon are being very proactive about solving these technological problems all by themselves. Um, so, yeah, we're getting a, a lot of different people coming at this from a lot of different directions, which I suppose gives us plenty to write about, doesn't it? Gives us a chance to use the word schism. <laughs> Yes, good word. I haven't Those used that enough recently. Can we spell uh, it? Well, I'll drink to that. And and on that note, there's a little forced segue there. Uh, Ray, yes, I understand you've been drinking a lot of vermouth recently. I have. What's I have. that all about? It's great. I recommend it. Yeah, is, it, is <laughs> vermouth bought, like martini? Uh, uh, the bit like red martini. I bought right. a bottle back from Spain. I'm trying not to drink it all in just a matter of days. But it slips um, down, it's, does it? Oh, where does vermouth come from originally? Not Spain, I'm guessing. I don't know. It doesn't sound Spain. <laughs> the supermarket. He doesn't need to know how it works. He just drinks it. And yes. you just have it straight up? Do you have it on ice? Do you have it with a mixer? On ice with a twist of fresh orange. Right, okay. But not like a vodka martini or something like that? No? I don't know. All right. I think All right. we should go try now. I'm clearly over-engineering <laughs> booze here. Do you, have a, do you have a sort of cocktail du jour that you're drinking in the Morris household? Not really, no. I, I, Tetley's? I, <laughs> yeah, it probably is Tetley's. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm more of a beer drinker, but um, drinker. Uh, I'm always always keen to try a new cocktail uh, as and when they're right. bought for me. Yeah, we got we've got actually quite a sort of um, alarming mix of cocktails in the, in the Bicino. We we like a vodka martini. We quite like a dark and stormy, which is rum and and ginger ale or ginger beer. I always get the two confused. And in in the summer, it's a it's a frozen margarita every time. Just basically a gr- adult slush puppy. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. I, I quite like that. Uh, is it Brazilian? The one with lots of mint. Caipirinha. Oh yeah, All that's right. good. Uh, Bra- oh, there's Brazilian another one as well, though, isn't there? Similar to Caipirinha. <laughs> Don't go into a cocktail oh, bar and say, "Can I have a Brazilian, please?" <laughs> 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 oh no, please do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so if you'd c- kindly bend over. Right. On that note, look, Pierre's doing the, the little chop neck thing. Okay, so on, on that slightly obscene note, uh, thank you very much for bearing with us and please join us for the next one. Thank you.